Hello and welcome to another Nerve podcast, Hope Beyond Brain Disease. I'm Lee Hatcher. With our ageing population, there's an increased and understandable focus on dementia, including a recognition that there are many and varied forms of the disease. In this podcast, maybe a surprise to many, HIV-related dementia. Of course, there have been huge strides in the treatment of HIV AIDS over the past generation. And one of the consequences of that is that those with the disease are living longer and showing the distinctive signs of HIV-related dementia. Professor Bruce Brew is one of Australia's leading authorities in neurology and HIV AIDS. He's conjoint professor of medicine at the University of New South Wales and adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Notre Dame. I'm so pleased that he's joining us for this nerve conversation on HIV-related dementia, beginning with how far we've come since those confronting early days of HIV AIDS. Back in the early 80s, uh, patients were really presenting with very advanced disease um, by and large, because the disease had only just been described and in the really early 80s there was no definitive test that came shortly after. And so they were presenting uh, in desperate straits, uh, most commonly with uh, severe pneumonia, sometimes with uh, meningitis and sometimes with uh, a dementing illness. Their prospects, if they had pneumonia, weren't so bad. Uh, They could respond to treatment. The underlying HIV disease was still a huge problem. Their prospects were not good until the mid-80s when AZT or Zodovidin came on to the scene and that certainly turned things around to an extent. So substantial amounts of money pretty soon flowed to this health issue. Can you briefly take us through beyond that? How did this progress for people and their prospects? So in the absence of definitive HIV treatment, there was inevitable progression to death within months. Then in the mid-80s, Sodovidin or AZT came along. That really showed that there could be uh, some response, and in some patients, quite dramatic response. When I was working in New York, uh, one of the other uh, neurologists um, on the staff had HIV disease, and uh, he described it as a light bulb moment when he started taking uh, Zodovidin, it turned things completely around for him. And then uh, as time went on, more definitive treatments for HIV came around. In the early 90s, there was combination therapy, usually with two drugs, and then, of course, the big three-drug breakthrough came in the mid-90s. So for those diagnosed with HIV AIDS today... What are their prospects compared to those days? It's essentially a modifiable disease. It's not a curable disease, clearly, and it's certainly uh, very treatable. Their prospects are very good. They can live, in general, an almost normal lifespan. However, they're still not normal in general. There are some patients who do extremely well, but there is a reasonably sized minority who don't do so well and have ongoing chronic inflammation, both systemically that is in the blood, as well as in the spinal fluid. Those patients um, either have or are at risk of other comorbidities and also at risk of the virus still affecting the brain. So there's a mistake to think that with antiviral therapy, even though the drugs are extremely good, that if you're below detection, that you're free from any risk of the virus affecting the brain. You're not. However, there's a sizable majority who are fine but a significant minority who are not. So one of the consequences of of living longer and being in better health comparatively is the emergence of HIV-associated dementia. How does that differ from other dementias? It is unusual in this day and age to develop HIV dementia per se. So that's using the term in the strictest sense. That is severe cognitive impairment enough to interfere with activities of daily living. The milder forms of impairment are much more common now, like mild cognitive impairment that patients um, have frequently diagnosed who then go on to develop Alzheimer's later on. How is HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder or mild cognitive impairment different from other dementias? It's more a psychomotor slowing. So the content of what people say who have this disorder is often not too bad. You pass it for normal but they're slower by and large. 
they often complain of forgetfulness and can't concentrate, they lose track of the conversation. These are relatively subtle deficits, but they can be impactful in a particular patient's life and sometimes can lead to demotions at their particular job or even cessation of their job because of inability to cope. When you say slower, in what way? Some they're practical just, um, examples. They're a little bit like a Parkinson's patient in that they just are slower to respond in a, a motor sense in terms of articulation, but also in just getting around. Their gait is a little slower as well, in contradistinction to Alzheimer's patients where they're not slow, they're just very forgetful by and large. Is it possible to determine a cause of this form of dementia and how it develops? So that's an ongoing controversy. The big paradox is that you have these really powerful antiviral drugs that are essentially have revolutionised HIV disease in general, and yet you still have the mild form of cognitive impairment. And you would think that the severe form of cognitive impairment would be harder for the antiviral drugs to treat, and the mild form should be really easy for the drugs to treat. But in fact, the converse is true. The, the situation I've, I've termed it is uh, a therapeutic paradox. Is it tough to diagnose? It can be tough to diagnose simply because there's no diagnostic test. It's not like cryptococcal meningitis, for example, uh, where you have a, a test where you, if you find the bug, you've got the answer. So you can certainly have impairment and you have to make sure that there are no other causes for that impairment. So it's more an exclusionary diagnosis, but at the same time it's got to be within the clinical bounds of probability. So it can be difficult to diagnose. It involves clinical assessment, ideally neuropsychological assessment, although that can be a resource issue. And then there should be imaging, preferred by MR scan, often with spectroscopy, which can be helpful, and spinal fluid analysis, because it can be suppressed in the blood, so the virus may be undetectable, but that may not be the case in the spinal fluid. So what should the patient themselves, friends, family, partners, be on the lookout for signs of HIV-associated dementia? If we broaden it to um, HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, so not really at the severe end, because that, that's usually quite easy to pick up. In the milder forms of the disorder, then I think family and friends should be alert to complaints of forgetfulness. So at a, at a superficial level, it may look like Alzheimer's, but uh, at a deeper level, it's not. But patients complain that they're more forgetful, um, lose track of conversation. They may give up reading uh, or find it longer to read. Their work performance can deteriorate because they can't organise themselves and multitask as well as they should. Is there treatment available? So that's where it gets tricky. There is, in a broad sense. So there are some patients who have this phenomenon called CSF viral escape. In other words, the antiviral drugs are working really well in the blood, but for whatever reason, the drugs don't get into the brain either at all or as well as they should. Now, in that case, investigations will show that and you can modify the antiviral drug regimen to optimise brain entry. There are some patients as well who seem to have inflammation in the spinal fluid and in the brain, but no detectable virus. That's where it gets a little tricky. And some people think that adding some other drug that gets into the brain to their existing regimen may be useful. And then there's a cohort of people who don't have detectable virus and not much in the way of inflammation. It's even less clear what the optimal treatment avenue is. There are some new drugs that are being uh, looked at, very early stage of development, to try to target that particular Achilles heel in the life cycle of HIV. It's worth noting two things, I think, that not everyone with HIV develops cognitive impairment and HIV today is also a disease experienced within the heterosexual community. Absolutely, it's very important. Our figures uh, would say that around 20%, maybe 30 40% at very most, would experience some degree of cognitive impairment. It depends on how long they've had the virus, how long they've been suppressed. Did they go through a period where they weren't on therapy for a while? Did their T-cell count become very low? But it is very true that heterosexuals are still at risk. 
it's important to realise that. Are there risk factors and are there measures that people can take with their health before this to reduce the risk? There are risk factors over and above sexual practice. There are lifestyle factors that probably are important. There is some emerging evidence that physical fitness can be a a significant positive factor in terms of reducing the risk. Mediterranean diet probably has benefits beyond just Alzheimer's disease and probably has some role in HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder. And absolutely, stop smoking. Yes, (laughs) for a whole lot of reasons. (laughs) Is there one particular, just as we wrap, one particular patient story you can relate to us to demonstrate, say, the benefits of early diagnosis and therefore treatment? Mm -hmm. So the person who comes to mind, uh, I looked after about uh, two years ago, and he was a successful travel agent and uh, was on therapy, doing very well for some years. And then he got sick of taking medications, which is not uncommon, and decided he was doing fine, so he'll stop medications. He was off medication for some two years and unfortunately presented uh, after being found by friends in a disheveled state. He uh, was unable to walk. He was completely uh, cognitively impaired to the point where he didn't know where he was. So he unequivocally had the severe end of impairment. We investigated him, had a high viral load in blood and spinal fluid, treated him with um, a combination of drug antiviral drugs that we knew would get into the brain well. And uh, after some months, and that's the key issue, I think, in, in these sorts of brain disorders, uh, recovery can take months. It's not like pneumonia where you get better in a few days or weeks. In his case, it took about six months and really not fully back on deck for about 12 months. Now, he was a particularly successful case because he regained the ability to walk. He can he can ambulate and run normally. He couldn't before. He was essentially bed-bound. And his cognition has come back significantly to the point where he's thinking about returning to work. Hard to know whether he'll be able to do that to the same level. But it's an instructive case because, uh, one, it shows the importance of maintaining medication to that the disorder is reversible to a very significant uh, degree in some people. There are clearly people in whom there is damage and you can't reverse that damage, but equally clearly there are some people who respond very well. Professor, it's been an important conversation and I'm sure revealing for many in our audience. Thank you so much indeed for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you. We're so grateful to Professor Brew for generously giving us his time and expertise. And thank you for joining us on this Nerve podcast, Hope Beyond Brain Disease. I'm Lee Hatcher. There's a whole host of information and resources at www.sidcog.com.au. Sidcog, S-Y-D-C-O-G,